Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tom Garcia, and we'd like to welcome you for coming today and participating in our web presentation entitled Arrhythmia Recognition is Not Just About Recognition Anymore. And my able bodied co presenter will be my son, Daniel Garcia, who's worked diligently by my side for many, many thousands of hours, and I'm really serious about that, in order to help bring this book and this presentation to life. So they asked me to talk a little bit about myself and explain a little bit about my background before we start getting on with the presentation. I'd like to start at the beginning, and as corny as it sounds, I always wanted to be a doctor. Before I attended medical school, I had a very long, illustrious career as a professional student. I took all kinds of courses, anything from poetry to mathematics to computers to art to you name it, I took it. And to support myself while I was going on this academic journey, I worked at a bunch of jobs, including getting certified and working as an EMT. That exposure was priceless to me. It left me with a feeling of respect, admiration, and a really fond spot in my heart for first responders and for the ancillary medical disciplines. Okay, it's something that you just don't get if you just go directly into medical school. Eventually, I settled down, I had my hair on fire, and I grew up and I decided to go get a medical degree. So I went to University of Miami School of Medicine and I graduated. After graduation, I became dual boarded in internal medicine and emergency medicine and was honored to become a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians. During that time, I held academic positions at Jackson Memorial Hospital at University of Miami, which is a great clinical program, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and Emory University. I've lectured nationally to clinicians at all levels and set up educational programs in electrocardiography and arrhythmia recognition all up and down the East Coast at some paramedic and nursing institutions, and specifically at the Brigham and at Grady Memorial Hospital. I've had the honor of being able to write various teaching texts, including 12 lead ECG, The Art of Interpretation, the introduction to 12 lead ECG, The Art of Interpretation, and the award-winning book, Arrhythmia Recognition, The Art of Interpretation. Presently, I'm continuing to write and hopefully restarting my EKG teaching page under the name ekgfacts.com. Keep your eye out for the next year. It'll eventually come out. Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Garcia. I'm going to be your co-presenter today. I just want to take a little time to introduce myself and give you a little bit about my background. So to start off with, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in biological sciences at Barry University in Miami, Florida. I am currently attending Tulane University School of Medicine, where I'm finishing up my third year of medical school. Uh, at Tulane, I was the founder of the Tulane University School of Medicine EKG Club, which was a really great experience. I also was the co-author and co-presenter to the Educate the Educator series, titled Arrhythmia Recognition, the Art of Education. Uh, you can find that on our YouTube channel if you're interested. Also, I am now the second author of the Arrhythmia Recognition book titled Arrhythmia Recognition, The Art of Interpretation. I hope you all enjoy our presentation. Have a good one. Now let's go on to medical education. Medical education is basically a subset of adult education. And the principles of adult education are fairly simple. The main principle of adult education is that adults learn only those topics that increase their functionality. In other words, they only care about things that make them better, that's useful to them. If it's not useful to them, they don't want to hear it. In this statement written by Leonardo da Vinci, he basically verbalized the pillars of adult education, didn't even know it. He basically stated that if you don't want to know something, you're not going to learn it, you're not going to use it, and you're not going to remember it. So don't even bother, okay? You need to give them something that's functional, something that will improve who they are and what they do and improve their system. So what do most students want in their books about electrocardiography or arrhythmia recognition? Exactly that. They want a book that could increase their functionality. It increases their ability to recognize, understand the mechanisms behind, and increase their ability to treat their patients. That's what they're looking for. That's the book we set out to create, and so far, after 18 years, most of the responses that I hear are pretty positive. So we're very happy about that. Now let's talk a little bit about the role of the educator. When it comes to arrhythmia recognition, 
The role of the educator is to educate the student in recognition, evaluation, and the clinical management of arrhythmias. How do you do that? You do that by preparing them for the real world. You let them know what they're going to be facing. You have to show them what it looks like. You have to show them how it works. That's what they expect of their parents. That's what they're going to expect of you as an educator. So the bottom line is that cardiac-related problems and complications are among the top clinical presentations that clinicians will face at any level of training. We need to prepare them for that. And we also need to be able to give them the tools that they're going to need to confront the situations that they're going to be facing. That means a little bit more increased curriculum time. That means more exposure to electrocardiography and arrhythmia recognition. Because as physicians get less and less training in that, which is happening in our med schools today, the role of the ancillary medical services is going to increase in their ability to spot abnormalities in electrocardiography. That's just a prediction I'm facing. And to tell you the truth, I've seen it happen for quite a few years. Lastly, we need to face the grim truth that no matter what we do, no matter how we prepare them, no matter what we give them as far as tools are concerned, most of their education is going to be based on the school of hard knocks. They're going to have to just go out there and face it and get the experience. But wouldn't it be nice to be able to send them out with a little bit of a helmet that protects them from the big bangs? Okay, that's part of your role. That's what you need to do. Prepare them for what's out there. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose your student just got done his training. He's his first day on a job. He's out there. Let's say he works in an emergency room and somebody just, you know, he gets an EKG and this is what it looks like. Would they know what they're looking at? Okay. I'll tell you what they're looking at. They're looking at a really ugly electrocardiogram. All right. So when we have a really ugly EKG, we have to start breaking it down. Okay. So before we actually break it down, let's make it a little bit difficult for ourselves because this is a course on arrhythmia recognition. So let's just look at the rhythm strip part of this EKG and forget about the rest. Because your student may not know all about electrocardiography, but they will know about arrhythmias by the time this gets done. So when we break it down, the first thing I want to take a look at is, boy, those QRS complexes are wide, and those ST segments and T waves are really abnormal compared to everything else that I've usually seen in a book. Right there, anything greater than 0.12 should raise one of three possibilities. One is, is it a right bundle branch block pattern? Is it a left bundle branch block pattern? And number three, is it an interventricular conduction delay? And if it is an interventricular conduction delay, the next question out of your mouth should be, is it hyperkalemia? I teach you that sequence because that's a sequence that you can bring out immediately and should be second nature to you. So let's take a look at this complex. Does it look like a right bundle? Well, it's kind of tough. It's lead two, but in a right bundle, you'd expect to see a little bit more of the slurring of the S wave. And this one doesn't really have a slurred S wave. It just has a generalized widening. Is it a left bundle? Well, you really can't tell, you know, so that's still a possibility. But the ST segments and everything else and the way the whole thing presents just doesn't look like your typical left bundle. And how can you tell that? Because you've seen a million of them. When you start seeing a lot of EK, a lot of left bundles, they develop a certain pattern and you start picking it up. So in that case, it isn't there. Now, your students knew they haven't seen a lot of patients. So let's just keep on moving. Width of the QRS complex is as great as 0.18 to 0.20, which is what this ECG rhythm strip shows, are really abnormal. And the most common cause of that are interventricular conduction delays. So right there, we're very suspicious about, is it an individual get a conduction delay? Now, the next thing is, it kind of looks like a wide complex tachycardia. So is it a wide complex tachycardia? Well, when you actually sit down and actually measure the rate, the rate actually ends up being around 72 to 75, something like that. And it's slightly irregular, irregularly irregular to be, to be truthful. And the P waves are very different between one to another with different PR intervals. Now, that would go along with a wandering eight-year-old pacemaker, but in the light of hyperkalemia or possible hyperkalemia, it's kind of a tough call to make because hyperkalemia can lead to rhythm abnormalities as well as pseudo-infarct patterns, which this patient does show on the, on the full EKG for those of you that have a lot of EKG knowledge. 
So let's take a couple of lessons from wide complex tachycardias, though, because they will give you a guidance to what you do when you meet a wide complex to begin with. Is it ventricular tachycardia? No, it's slightly irregular. It's all over the place, and the morphologies are changing constantly. I don't see capture of fusion beats. No evidence of AV dissociation, so I don't think it's a ventricular tachycardia. Is it an old bundle branch block that's showing up in this particular rhythm? If it's 0.18 to 0.20, it's really doubtful that it is, and if it is, it's a very rare occurrence. So let's just say no. Is it an accessory pathway? Well, that's not your typical presentation for an accessory pathway, which causes orthodromic or antidromic, and usually it's associated with tachycardias. Or if it's not tachycardic, it would give you the, the delta wave pre-excitation issue. So that's not it. So is it rate-related? Well, it's 72 beats per minute. You know, 72 beats a minute, you usually don't get rate-related changes. So you're left with metabolic. So from two different sources, you have the possibility this is an intraventricular conduction delay secondary to a metabolic process. And the obvious metabolic process is hyperkalemia. Would they know what they're looking at when they see that? It's a good question. But you can work it out just from the rhythm strip, even if you don't see the rest of the EKG. Would they know how fast they need to react? And that's a critical question. When you have this kind of width in the intervitricular induction delay, you're very close to a sine wave or a complete asystole. So in those cases, you have to act very quickly. You have seconds, not minutes, not hours to react. You have to react very fast. So, that, so your students should be able to sit there and say, this is something that's going to require emergent treatment. And they either need to start it or they need to get somebody to start it as quickly as possible. Do they understand why they need to react quickly? Well, the reason is hyperkalemia, as I mentioned before, gives you seconds. And what's the final solution to a hyperkalemic patient if it's left untreated when it gets to this point? Death. Okay, so if you don't want your patient to die, you better move quick. Okay, that's incentive enough. And then the next thing is you may be able to get them back, but remember, when you have hyperkalemia and you, you're treating a cardiac arrest, you're giving epinephrine, you're giving them atropine, you're giving them all these medications, which may not actually take effect because the hyperkalemia may be affecting the interaction of the drug with the actual cell. So in that case, what happens is if you do manage to bring them back, you're going to have a bunch of floating epinephrine and atropine all over the place, which could actually give you a very serious ischemic event. And if not, you may have to treat the hyperkalemia first and then treat the cardiac arrest. Either one of those two cases is really a tougher scenario to deal with. So they need to know how fast they need to react. That's just a little short blurb. When we go back to seeing the full ECG, it goes beyond the scope of what I want to talk about in this particular presentation. But it's a very interesting ECG. You should just take a picture of it and just evaluate it for yourself. So what can we do about it? Do we want them to go through a school of hard knocks? Did we not teach them appropriately? Did they answer the questions correctly? Did they get to that spot? As an educator, you really should be thinking about those questions. And as a student, you really should be thinking even more about those because you're the one that's going to be facing the school of hard knocks. At Jones and Bartlett, we have a lot of products. These products basically take you from the very beginning of your training all the way through to a very advanced. We really take it very seriously. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very proud that they actually have included us in their lineup, because it is a great lineup that anybody can get something from, regardless of whether you're a nurse, a physician's assistant, a cardiovascular tech allied health professional, paramedic, medical student, or physician. doesn't matter where you're at. There's something in there for everybody. And, by the way, we've got your back. And needless to say, we know which ones are the true backbones of the system. <coughs> um, yeah, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at arrhythmia recognition once again, because this is what this is all about. So let's take a look at, well, let's take a look at this little quote because I wanted to fit it in here somewhere because it's such a great quote. So this is a good spot as any. Recipes tell you nothing, but learning techniques is the key. That was said by Tom Colicchio. 
And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Tom Colicchio, he's actually the top chef in Top Chef. He's the one who actually runs the, uh, the whole system. He was basically talking about cooking, but it really does translate very nicely into arrhythmia recognition. So let's move on. So this is a graphic representing the first edition of the arrhythmia recognition book. Due to the success of the 12 lead ECG book, a lot of people came over to me afterwards in different conferences and different places and said, can you write one on arrhythmias? So I said, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. And arrhythmia recognition, once again, is a book that I wanted to have a lot of graphics and a lot of intensive training in there. So I sharpened my little electronic pencil and I started to become a much better graphic artist. And, uh, and I figured a picture was worth a thousand words, so I was going to include as many of them as I could. And it's funny because a lot of people say to me, well, sometimes you're, you know, some of the graphics are pretty um, amateurish. And I'm like, duh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm a doctor. You know, I'm not a graphic designer. But to try to get across the thoughts of a physician into a graphics designer's head so that they can reproduce it is very, very difficult. And not all of us are Frank Netter. From the start, the first edition of the book was really successful, and it actually almost immediately won the American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year in 2004. I want you to notice that that, not to brag, but this is the American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year. It doesn't say Electrocardiography Book of the Year, so it was pretty well received. The success of the book basically came about because people were just really in love with a friendly, laid-back style. Some of the, uh, the instructors didn't like that style. They liked something a little bit more formal, but I wrote the book for students. So it's important for you as a student to feel comfortable in how you learn. And a lot of people said basically it was like I was in the room next to them, teaching them as they were going along in their, in their progress. So for the most part, the, the book is written in very short chapters that you could read in little packets, and it's a fantastic way of uh, learning but it is sequentially meant to teach you. It goes from one step to the next, to the next, to the next. So sometimes if you pick up the book and you turn to the back, you sit there and you go, man, that's complicated stuff. But by the time you get there, if you go through from one cha chapter one all the way through the end, you'll be more than ready to handle that situation. And that's what you want out of a book. You want the book to take you on a journey of education where by the end of the time, you actually know the product. You actually know the discipline. Now, I am going to state that a lot of people always complain to me that I do not address treatment strategies in a book. There's a reason for that. And the main reason is that once you create a book and it, you stick treatment in it, it's almost obsolete when it first comes out because the treatment strategies are changing so dramatically and so fast that you just can't keep up with it with a printed text. It takes an average of two to three years to get a book from completion to publication. It takes that long for the graphics to be designed, for the editors to make their, their, their changes, for this whole entire back and forth process. So it takes a really long time to get it out there. Even if you have a yearly review, you still probably by the time you get it out, what happens if you take out the book in January and all of a sudden in February they change to a new guideline? Well, if that's the case, then your book's already obsolete and it's only a month old. So I don't think treatment really has a place in a good book on medicine. We have, not in today's day and age anyway, because we have the internet. We can get instant access to the latest up-to-date information on treatment. My personal opinion is a textbook should show you the, the mechanics. They should show you the specifics. They should show you the history and physical, all the data that you need for clinical management of a patient, but it should leave out the treatment. This way, your textbook will last for two, three, five, 10, 15 years. If not, it's already obsolete by the time it comes out. So think about that and take a look at it and take a look at all your books and see whether you actually want to sit there and spend the time to learn that, that treatment strategy or whether my idea makes a little bit more sense. So without much ado, let's move on. And it's an, it, this is going to be an amazing rollout, okay? Because for the first time, you guys are going to be exposed to the new, 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 new second, second edition, edition of Arrhythmia Recognition, recognition the, art the Art of Interpretation. interpretation. Love the cover. Great stuff. I love Da Vinci. I'm just in love with that book. But 
more than the cover, I'm more in love with the content and with the changes that we've made to it since the first edition, which I think are really going to be very beneficial for students. So let's take a look at the brief content page. This is a little section right at the beginning, which basically just gives you the title and the location of each individual chapter. We have a more advanced index inside, but this is actually a really good page to take a look at because it gives you a general overview of what's happening. It's broken down into sections, and each section is a major topic of electrocardiography, and then that major section is broken down into chapters. So let's go through starting at the individual chapter level and see what's consistent about these chapters. Each chapter is composed of a bunch of stuff. We're going to go through them one at a time. I'm just showing here listed to you all at once. So basically you see there's a lot going on in every chapter. But they're actually very short and very easy to read. So don't let that fool you. Let's start off with course objectives. Everybody wanted course objectives because they felt that it gives you the little viewpoint of what you're going to be looking at as you start reading. What are the important points? So we included course objectives because it's a great idea. And for instructors, they wanted something called Bloom's Taxonomy course objectives. So we did that basically for the educators. So everybody should be happy with that particular part. The next thing we're going to talk about is actually the beginner's perspective. And we're really, 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 really impressed with this particular section and enthused about presenting it out to you. But I'm going to let Dan talk about that for a little bit since it's his section. Dan, you want to take it away? So to give you guys a little bit of an idea about how we came up with the concept of the beginner's perspective, uh, let me give you a little background. So since I'm my father's son, I was exposed to a lot of clinicians and a lot of really great medical educators while I was growing up. One of the common themes I noticed with their teachings, however, was oftentimes they would know the material very, very well and had a really great mastery of their craft. However, when they tried to explain it to their students, it might appear really easy to them, but to the student, it was extremely complicated. And virtually the same as trying to listen to Greek, it was really just very difficult for them. So what I want to do with a beginner's perspective is try to kind of like lessen the gap between the beginner and the expert and really make it easier for the two to understand each other. I want to provide some of the solutions to the hard knocks that I went through while I was learning about arrhythmia recognition. And that's really what we were trying to do with this section. Thanks, Dan. That was great. The main teaching sections are where you get most of your education from. This is the one where we actually spend the most time going on into it. I spend a lot of time on analogies because I believe analogies is a great way to get thoughts across. But the best way to get thoughts across are graphics and examples. And we have a lot of graphics and a lot of examples which are very well delineated. And they're marked up to actually be very simple to take a look at. So by the time you get done, you're going to have a very good concept of what we were trying to get across. Then we have the arrhythmia recognition boxes. The arrhythmia recognition boxes are basically a snapshot of the rhythm. It has all the information you need to be able to diagnose it. It has the rate, the regularity, the P wave morphology, what's it look like? Is it upright? Does it come from the sinus node? the PQRS conduction ratio, the PR intervals, the QRS widths, whether it's grouped or not grouped, which is really important, especially for AV blocks, and the presence of drop beats. Those are all very important aspects of arrhythmia recognition, which you'll realize once you get done with the book. Or if you know something about that already, then you're already familiar with it. The differential diagnosis box is actually one of the most critical parts, in my opinion, is one of the most critical parts of this book. Because people are forgetting what the differential diagnosis stands for. The differential diagnosis is there because you want to be able to make sure that you've thought of everything else that it potentially could be. In other words, you think it's this, but what else could cause those particular issues? It's important as heck to have because if you don't think about something, you won't diagnose it. And a lot of times people just go, oh, I think it's this, I think it's A, and all of a sudden it's B. All right. So if you have certain findings and you put them together and you think it's this, think about other things that could cause it. And if you think about it, you'll make the right diagnosis. You can narrow it down to that point. 
Next, we're going to talk about the end of the chapter test. We're going to spend a lot of time on testing in a few seconds, but basically at the end of every chapter, every clinical chapter related to an arrhythmia, we have a small end of the chapter test. It could be anywhere from 5 to 10, 15 strips, depending on the uh, chapter, where basically we show you all kinds of different presentations for the rhythm that we're discussing in that chapter. A little bit more about that later. And then each chapter ends up with a chapter quiz or review, where basically just reinforce the material that's most important inside the chapter itself. Now, every chapter also has little tidbits of information, for example, like clinical pearl boxes or additional information boxes. This is an example of an additional information box. An additional information box is stuff that most people don't really learn right off, and a lot of introductory books don't have, but it's really important. Like in this case, you have a normal sinus rhythm. Now, what occurs during the PR interval? Because a lot of times people look at this and they go, oh, the PR interval is just the length of the time that it takes the P wave to the time that actually the QRS complex starts. But if you really look at it, it is the entire conduction system. It's conduction. It's a time when conduction of electricity starts at the sinus node and ends in the Purkinje fibers. All of that takes place right there, okay, in that PR interval. So we break it down for you and we show you what the important parts are. Where it's at the, at the P wave, when it does atrial contraction, when it goes to the AV node, when it goes to the bundle branch blocks, et cetera. So the additional information boxes are really great little teaching tools and I love using them. Now the book has over 700 strips and it has hundreds of graphics. And that's super helpful. If you have really great graphics, then you're going to have really good learning. And between the strips and the graphics, you should be really well set. Now, let's look at the brief contents again and just kind of start looking at what we have. When we look at the contents, we see that it's actually composed of seven sections. And the seven sections are, as I mentioned before, an entire concept of arrhythmia recognition or an entire region of arrhythmia recognition so we can start getting some sort of a foundation and some sort of hierarchy as we address this topic. So let's take a look at them individually. The first one is Introduction to Arrhythmia Recognition. This section is basically teaching you how, what you need to know before you actually start getting into the rhythms. We have the stuff on the anatomy and physiology, the electrophysiology, the paper and the tools. How do you read these things? But it has a little sections in there which are really excellent. And one of them is vectors and basic beats. A lot of places don't go into vectors, and a lot of arrhythmia books don't go into vectors. But the formation of vectors is what actually leads to the strip having a pattern. Your P, Q, R, S, and T are all graphical representations of the vectors that are occurring inside the heart. So it's an important concept to gather, and we try to put that for you right there in Chapter 4. Chapter 5 is an introduction to 12 lead ECGs. What you need to know about 12 lead ECGs in order to discuss arrhythmias. And that's an important chapter. Electrocardiography and arrhythmia recognition is an extension of some of those concepts. For example, fusion, those type of things will be covered under Chapter 6. And, and Chapter 7 is actually a student-requested chapter because everybody wanted to have an idea about how to read it a rhythm strip before they got to understand rhythm strips. You want to talk about an interesting topic, try to come up with something before you teach them what it is. It's kind of tough, but what I do in that chapter is I basically give you 10 questions to look at. You try to answer these questions and that'll give you, that'll lead you to the right answer. It's a fairly drawn out chapter and I go through a very cursory look at every rhythm that's inside this book, just about in there. So by the time you get done, you have a general good idea, an overall idea about what we're looking at. The next section is sinus rhythm. Normal sinus rhythm is the basis of everything in electrocardiography. If you, if you don't know what is normal, you can never tell what's abnormal. So that chapter is actually a pretty big one. We actually have that available for you to take a look at before. Uh, I'm going to show you the link later on where you can actually pick up a copy of that chapter and you can take a look at it. Once again, normal sinus rhythm is usually forgotten by most books, but it actually is the basis of, of the entire arrhythmia recognition process. 
The next section is atrial rhythms. You have a lot of rhythms in that section, and there are a lot of rhythms that are very commonly found. So it's an important chapter to do. I really don't want to focus on one chapter more than another. They're all amazing, um, very good chapters. The junctional rhythm chapter, I want to point out three of them specifically. Chapter 25 and chapter 26 are associated with AV reentry, with AV reentry circuits. And the circuits are important, and that's probably the first time you're really going to be exposed to a serious discussion about reentry circuits and mechanisms. So I've taken an analogy which is very common and most people can understand very easily and wrote extensively on that in those two chapters. So you should get a very good perspective on it when you get done. Chapter 27 covers the narrow complex supraventricular tachycardias. Usually a lot of times the books just basically spend one paragraph covering the topic and supraventricular tachycardias are much more complex than that. In 2015, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association came up with new guidelines for the evaluation of supraventricular tachycardias. And they covered the whole umbrella term of all the rhythms that are associated with it and also the wide complex tachycardias. It's altered the way we look at it. We no longer look at it like it's just a very simple description. We look at it like it's a lot more complex. But by the same token, the amount of clinical information you can get from that is excellent, especially in the emergent period and the urgent periods of patients when they first show up. And that's what we're going to be trying to concentrate on, especially in the wide complex tachycardia section, which is the next one that we're going to be discussing. So in the ventricular rhythm section, I'm going to point out those four little chapters, 34, 35, 36, and 37, because the wide complex tachycardias are usually the ones that have the highest mortality. So you want to take a look at that very closely. And it isn't just saying, oh, it's greater than 0.12 and it's a tachycardia. So therefore, it's a wide complex tachycardia. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it. It's a lot more complex and there's been a lot of research about it. So it's going to be all covered there. The criteria that's being used today's day and age is all covered there including some mnemonics that I created in order to help you have memory aids to remember the certain protocols that are there. I think you're going to get a lot out of that chapter, and it's definitely the future. Next is the additional rhythm and information section, which covers artificial paced rhythms, and also one of my favorite chapters, which is putting it all together, where basically at the beginning we taught you how to review a, a rhythm strip and we taught you the 10 questions. Here we go into the 10 questions, but now you do know what we're talking about with the tachycardias and with the arrhythmias. So when you know that information, I can get a lot more into it, and that's what we do in Chapter 40. And then finally, Section 7 is the final test, and that's going to be covered under the test section, which we're going to be discussing next. So there's three levels of testing that we have in the book. One of them is the end of the chapter test, which, as I mentioned before, at the end of every clinical chapter, there is a small test. Then we have section tests, where we cover everything that happened in that one clinical section. So they're pretty important, and they're usually about 20-some around there, strips and answers, which is very, that's an important point, the answers. And then we have the final test sections, which one of them has 50 questions, the other has 75, and once again, they have answers. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, your typical test question in a book is basically just they give you a strip and then they give you an answer. And the answer is supraventricular tachycardia. If you're lucky, they give you that typical answer. A lot of times they just show you the strip and they don't tell you what it is, which is really a nightmare because you don't know whether you're right or wrong. But at least if they give you an answer, you know what's going on. So in this particular case, they say supraventricular tachycardia. But does that teach you anything? I don't think it teaches you anything. What I like doing is I'm going to give you a question. When I give you the question, I'm going to give you a little box down there that I want you to fill in. That little fill in the box is associated with those arrhythmia recognition boxes that are in every chapter, and also with the questions that I ask you to be able to interpret a rhythm. So if you get used to doing that, you get used to developing a pattern, and that's what we want you to do. Develop a second nature pattern where you actually come up with the right answers. And then, in order to actually let you get something out of that, 
I not only give you the answers to the little box, but we sit there and we give you a discussion section about it so that we show you how we got to the answer that we got. Because a lot of times, just having an answer is good, but having an answer explain to you how they got to that answer is the way you actually learn mechanisms. It's the way you learn those little fine-tuned points to actually be able to interpret rhythm strips. So that's the way we approach testing and answers. You'll find it novel, but you'll find it an amazing teaching tool. Finally, once again, I want to go back and talk about the five new redesigned chapters for superventricular tachycardias and wide complex tachycardias. Those are really important chapters. I keep pointing them out because I think they're going to be very critical. Three chapters are dedicated only to helping you put it all together. Now, in addition to the book, we also have a companion website. And in the website, we have what's called high-yield chapters. And what we did was to actually take the five chapters that we just included for the superventricular tachycardias, and we took all the fluff and all the educational stuff and all the stuff and gave you the sheer facts of what you need to know about it. We narrowed it down to the trim basics. And that's what's called a high-yield chapter. It's becoming a new thing now for medical students and for advanced education. So we're giving it to you. I don't like learning that way because you don't really learn from high-yield chapters, but they're great for reviews. So that we put them on the companion website to make them available for you. We also include some animations, which are basically just like small video clips about particular functions. For example, ventricular reentry systems. We show you how they actually develop, how they go around. So they're included in there as well. Terminology flashcards. If you don't know what the language is, you won't understand a thing about it. So the terminology flashcards are important because you get to know different things like conduction ratios and those type of terminology issues. Once again, we included the learning objectives, so it would be easier for you to take a look at some of them. If you're out in the field, you can actually take a look at them and you're in the net and not have to worry about being there. And that seems to be a big issue with a lot of learners. So, um, so that's, that's why we included them there. And additional content will be added as time goes on. So we're going to be adding a little bit more to this. Check back from time to time. You're going to get some good stuff out of it. And last but not least, we have an instructor resource kit which includes slides in PowerPoint format. It includes lecture outlines, which will, you could pass out to your students, and an image bank of most of the images and most of the strips that we have inside the book, which will be great because you could take those and you can put them in your own format, in your own PowerPoint slides, and they'll be very helpful for that. We really appreciate you participating in this conference, and we really appreciate the time you took to do this. I know time is valuable, and you really have been a great audience. So if there's any questions at all, you can contact your public safety specialist at the site noted, and they'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Or if you have questions for me, they can forward them to me and I can respond to you. There's also a link for a sample chapter, which I mentioned before, which is this chapter on normal sinus rhythm. You can take a look at it. You can see some examples of the graphics. You can take a look at some of the, the end of the chapter test and also the review quiz. So thank you very much. Bye.